Hello, and welcome to the Pond Pro Pod. Today, I have Tony Gallo on today. He's from Sapphire Risk. Tony and I have known each other like for a very long time. If you're new to this space, you might not know him, but if you're not new to this space, then you definitely know him. Um, this is our first podcast that kind of broadens the, uh, the speaker. So thank you, Tony, for coming on today. Thank you for having me on. Let's just, um, maybe for the people that don't know who you are, maybe you can talk about how you got into the pawn world and then specifically how you found your way to um, starting Sapphire Risk. Sure. So uh, um, I've been in the pawn business since 1996. Uh, 17 years, I was the director of security for a company called Easy Pawn or Value Pawn, depending on what state you're in. Uh, uh, managed uh, 1,300 pawn shops when it came to the security and their audit department uh, in three countries, uh, Canada, United States, and Mexico. Um, about 11 years ago, I started Sapphire, uh, focusing mainly on high-risk businesses uh, with the security in mind. So that would be any business with a large amount of cash and a very desirable piece of merchandise, pawn shops, jewelry stores, liquor stores, convenience stores, firearm stores. We also got into the legalized cannabis industry uh, and uh, been pretty active in that. Uh, since then, we've worked with pawnbrokers and uh, jewelry store owners across the United States. Uh, uh, most of our work is uh, on-site risk assessments. Uh, we'll evaluate the security of the, of the current location, look at their SOPs, and help them uh, be more secure. Uh, most of my staff is uh, ex pawn security people, most of them obviously from Easy Pawn. So I'm pretty excited about the, the team I have. That's awesome. Um, let's just jump into the risk assessments that you do. Are there like a top three most common red flags? Like you walk into a store and it's like, ding, red flag. Uh, what would those three things be? So um, uh, there is actually, so I break it down into the physical security first. We'll start with that. Okay. A lot of times the physical security hasn't been reviewed by the pawnbroker in a number of years. So we'll find gaps in their security, whether their camera system, maybe at one time the camera was watching one part of the, the jewelry case, but now the jewelry case is moved, but mm -hmm. they never moved the camera system. Right. Uh, the alarm system uh, uh, maybe one of the sensors or the sensors aren't where they needed to be at, at any given time. So a lot of times we'll go into a, a pawn shop and evaluate their video, the alarms, their access control, and come to the conclusion that there's gaps in their security. And a lot of times we don't want those gaps to be utilized by someone breaking in and the alarm not going off or someone stealing and you don't have camera coverage there anymore. So we'll look at that. We'll look at equipment. Uh, sometimes some of the equipment is a little older than it should be, or is there, or is there a new way to do that? And we'll, we'll look at that also. The other thing we look at is policies and procedures. Uh, you know, uh, is there a robbery awareness training uh, mm -hmm. program? Is there a cash management program? Is there what we call culture of honesty design where, you know, mm -hmm. employees aren't still, what to do if there was a shoplifter? What to do if there was a, an emergency? You know, California, we might do earthquake review. In uh, Florida, we might do hurricane. In Oklahoma, we might look at tornadoes. So a lot of times we'll look at that. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, obviously the most important thing is is what kind of level of training do the employees have right. to protect the, not only the, the employees at the location, the customers, but also the assets. In a perfect world, how often would you recommend that a store operator or owner is reviewing all of these policies and procedures and trainings with their team? We usually ex we usually say an annual review of everything. One uh, all encompass review a year is good enough. I think the camera system should be looked at, uh, you know, at least quarterly to make sure everything is 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 running, and then daily just to make sure that the cameras are on. You'll, you'll be amazed how many times we'll point out and say this camera's not working, and they're like, oh. Uh, you know, we didn't even realize it wasn't working and it has been working for months, which means no one is act obviously looking at the cameras. Right. It's one thing to have the cameras. It's another to review what's uh, being recorded. What are some of the like the best practices for placements of cameras or um, obviously making sure that they're turned on would be the most important thing. But um, 
Well, when you think of security in a pond, you want to think of security like an, like an onion. You're peeling back the layers. And mm -hmm. obviously, when we're talking about the camera system, the very first thing you want to make sure going from the outside in is that you have cameras that can see all aspects of the building, the side, the back, the trash, mm -hmm. all yeah. of that. Make sure that that camera system uh, works at night. It you know has a good uh, iris uh, uh uh, review of that, uh, that, you know, you're able to identify license plates and so forth. Then right. you work your way in. You want to make sure that the most important areas, you know, your pond safe has adequate coverage on the cameras. Uh, you want to make sure that the sales floor has good coverage, that you can identify shoplifters, especially in those corners, and that you have good coverage over the jewelry. You know, a, a lot of times, again, uh, that jewelry case might have moved out of camera view, or the camera may need to be uh, realigned to get a better view of, uh, of the jewelry uh, uh, elements. That's super helpful. Uh, before Tony and I jumped on, like my, my whole idea of today's podcast is to leave you guys with, um, some actionable insights that you can take. And then also if you're not familiar with Tony, introduce you to him, um, because he's the go-to for security and risk. So, um, I should have started with that, but what are some of, I guess, overall the industry security trends that you're seeing today? You know, um, I, I think we're seeing uh, two two exposures. Obviously, the external exposure that comes in, uh, the robberies and the break-ins that are that occur and, and are continuing to occur. We also are now seeing a component of where there might be uh, opportunity for looting that maybe 20 years ago we didn't see. You know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we had a big eye opening a few years ago when there were the riots that were going across the United States and. You know, a, a number of pawn shops that we worked with were, were, were broken into. Or if the alarm system isn't working, how long are you going to be able to fend off someone's tacking? You know, the most important item when it comes to, you know, other than the employees and customers, of course, is the jewelry loans. And how do you protect those jewelry loans? How do you make sure that they're, they're not being breached or someone's not cutting into the safe? Uh, you know, uh, there are... Uh, numerous ways of preventing that from happening when it comes to that. And, you know, that's really a kind of a, a big exposure when we see there. And then the other is the internal. You know, uh, the majority of the losses in the pawn shop will continue to be employees, whether it's employees that uh, do not uh, understand how to do a, a loan properly or people that are going to do dishonest things, you know, giving opportunity. Uh, in the majority of the losses uh, when I, at Easy Pawn were internal, not external. I think and a lot of the pawnbrokers are focusing on that external part and not and not looking at that. You know, I, I do a lot of uh, presentations in the, in the pawn industry and I have an expression and, you know, it's kind of lighthearted. But, you know, friends steal and family steals more. So, yeah. you know, it's always, you know, it's always that kind of uh, misplaced trust that a lot of times we'll get, uh, you know, most of the big losses are those overloaning uh, theft issues. So let's talk about audits for, for a second. I know that that was a, probably a huge process that you ran at Easy. What are the best ways for a store to audit their inventory and loan balance? How often should that be happening? Do you recommend cycle counts? Do you recommend kind of like a randomized count? Um, how would you, what's best practice for in-store audits? I think the first thing you need to make sure, going back to that culture of honesty we were speaking about, is that it's communicated that you do audits. That solves a big problem where people know, oh, I can't take that ring because someone's going to find out immediately that I took the ring. Unlike, I can't take that ring, but no one will know for the next 30 days because no one does an audit. So, right. jewelry, you know, uh, customer jewelry, you know, sales jewelry, I, I recommend you do an opening audit, uh, an opening count. Uh, some, some do it by cases. Uh, some do it by elements. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I've seen uh, numerous ways to do that, whatever you feel more comfortable with. Uh, you know, obviously, sometimes I like the fact that all of the uh, rings slots are filled with something to indicate that no one has removed a ring, which you can quickly identify. And then, and, and then a night count, 
that is also done. So you can determine whether a loss and when that a loss occurs when it comes to that. Um, I think that inventory law, uh, audits, uh, I like to see if you're not doing it at least uh, every, every uh, uh, six months, you know, uh, try and do them as quickly as you can. The earlier the possible, again, some of these uh, loan balances are lower. You know, I, I work with people that have under $100,000 loan balances, and I work with people that have $20 million loan balances in some, some situations. So it really depends on how that works. But the key to an audit in the pawn industry that would reduce the losses is to communicate that you are doing the audit. Yeah. That makes sense. You know, I look at like our utilization of products a lot in Bravo and we have physical inventory app um, for doing audits and cycle counts and things like that. And it's like when you look at the number of people that have it turned on and, and are paying for physical inventory audit, and then you look at how many audits are done per year, it's almost like the average is like one audit per year per user. There's obviously users that are doing like 30 in a month or they're doing cycle counts more frequently, they're they're in it. But I think a lot of people kind of check the box on like their one inventory audit for the year and that's that's it, that's all they're doing. No, I, 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 and that sends a message. People see that, employees see that. People understand you know, what that exposure. I would say the majority of the time an employee steals from their owner, whether it's pawn or jewelry or any other retail type of business, is because they're giving the opportunity to do that. And you yeah. reduce that opportunity, you greatly reduce their desire to steal from you. Totally. Um, what are some of the, I guess, most common ways that you've seen, or maybe just the most common way you see employees steal from an operator? Um, the hardest one, and maybe not the most, but the hardest one is overloaning. A friend comes in, you overloan, you bring in this pen, and the pen is, you know, uh, let's just make it make it a very valuable pen. It's $100 and you loan $500 on it. It's very difficult to, um, you might be able to fire them, but it's very difficult to prosecute someone because you entrusted them in the loaning process. So mm -hmm. at the end of the night, if no one's reviewing those loans and later on, you know, you start now, 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 now these loans start to drop or they, right. or, or, or they start to extend the loans or whatever. But, you know, to go and try and prosecute or bring that to the police's attention, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, also, we see, uh, you know, handouts occur or, or allowing friends to shoplift, um, you know, or something of that nature. But um, less cash theft. You know, there are obviously people that do steal cash from the register, but a lot of it is people taking advantage of the system and, and producing. And, you know, if it, you can produce you can you can easily, easily steal, you know, fifty thousand dollars to one hundred thousand dollars without anyone catching it. If there are certain breakdowns in your procedures. Totally. Um, what would be some advice for somebody that's newly getting into the pawn industry. So they're just, you know, they're just starting or um, they're thinking of starting. I think a lot of it has to do with the communication, uh, policies mm -hmm. and procedures, making mm -hmm. sure you have a good understanding of what should occur, uh, you know, even to the point of like emergency management. What happens if there's a fire? Who gets a fire signature? Who calls the fire company? What happens if someone's had a heart attack? Who dials 911? What if you see a shoplifter? What if there's an earthquake? What if there's a hurricane? And these aren't even secure. These are more of the safety part of it. But how do you communicate that? You know, uh, uh, um, the, the value of customer service and, and making sure that that only reduces shrinkage and losses, but that value is important also in, in, in good managing your business. Accounting for things, you know, when do you do your audit? When do you do your account? When do you do your review? You know, have a procedure that says at the end of the night you can do a package check. Whether you actually do them or not, maybe once every six months, you show up in the parking lot at the end of the night and say, oh, I'm going to check everyone's bag. You, you wouldn't have to do that for another year because everyone would know, oh, my God, they can check my bag. So there's a lot of things. How do you open and close? Biggest, biggest uh, losses that occur are at opening and closing of a store, not, not during the day with the, when it comes to robberies. So how do you, what's your procedure when it comes to that? 
Yeah, I was going to ask if there's like uh, times of day that are most common, um, but it sounds like if you have process around some of these things, then um, you just eliminate or at least highly reduce the risk of being susceptible to it. A well-run business is very profitable and a, a poorly run business is when you have problems. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about like external theft. Um, any common themes you mentioned looting probably more relevant a few years ago, but anything that you're seeing today, like for a while, I feel like I kept seeing, um, cars running into stores that didn't have the blocks outside. Is there anything like that that you're seeing like kind of on repeat? We are seeing the cars, uh, drive throughs, especially if you don't have bowers in the front or heavy flower pots in the front of that nature. Uh, the roll downs are important, but again, if you don't have them, the car is going to hit the roll down anyway, and then they're going to come in. We do, we are seeing start, uh, again, and this goes back, an increase in break-ins, but the break-ins are occurring in a pawn shop that next door, let's say there's no one in that, it's a strip center, and next door there's no one in there. Uh, they break into the next door, then they cut through the sheetrock, but they don't enter the building, and then they wait for you to come in and unlock the door and turn the alarm off, and then they rush you. And those losses are very significant. They can clean out everything out of the safe. They could spend an hour in the store, no one would be able to understand, because the store is locked because you're coming in to open it up. So we are right. seeing a rise in that or with the alarm systems being bypassed at night and then they're cutting into the safe. And again, if you don't have a, a TL rated or above uh, uh, safe in the pawn industry, then you shouldn't be in the pawn industry, in my opinion. If you go to Costco or Walmart and you buy a gun safe, I can go to Home Depot and buy a, a saw that cuts right through that like anything then you really should reconsider whether, you know, obviously the, the pawn safe and the pawn guard that we see in most stores is the best way to go. But at a minimum, you should have a TL or TR rated safe. What's the craziest uh, external theft story that you have? The craziest external theft story that I ever had. Um, my favorite one was obviously at Easy Pawn, where uh, the alarm system went off in the middle of the night, and the, uh, st the store manager responded with the police, and the police came in with the dogs, and the dogs were going crazy, and they spent all they spent most of that night, and they could not find anyone, but that dog was losing it the whole night. Somewhere around 11 o'clock in the morning, they started hearing whimpering from the air conditioning system. Because what happened was the guy broke in through the air conditioning ducts on the roof, and then he got caught and stuck. His clothes got stuck, where he spent six hours or so stuck in the air conditioning the system. <laughs> and, and then they turned the air conditioner on that that night. That, that, so in the morning by 11 o'clock, he had given it up. So that's my, that's my favorite break-in story of the, the stupid criminal. Yeah, Burr, that sounds cold. <laughs> Um, for somebody that maybe feels like overwhelmed with this conversation, I, f I feel like sometimes, um, talking about like risk assessment and I, like, it, it, I feel like it can feel maybe overwhelming, like, oh my God, I'm not doing anything. Therefore I'll continue to do nothing. Is there anything like low hanging fruit? That's like, at least get started with this, like a review of your SOPs or like, um, what would be the lowest hanging fruit, one or two items, just to like dip your toe in and start feeling like you're making progress on this? Well, I think, that, you know, one of the things you look at is see, do you have a standard operating procedure when it comes to security? You know, uh, I would look at the cameras. But if you said to me, like, what's the number one thing, non-physical, that costs no money really to do that I would uh, put in my procedures today? And that's your... Where's your big exposure when it comes to an external break-ins or robberies? The, and, and a lot of people don't realize that. It's your parking lot. Being able to make sure that the graffiti is removed and that the store does not speak the, that come and rob me scenario. Parking lot's clean. There's, there's no messes. There's nothing that, that says to you that you don't care about the pawn shop, so why should the bad guy... Right. I think that's where I would I would start with a clean parking lot. It's amazing. 
Unfortunately, or for, you know, fortunately, I've I've dealt with over 2,000 pawn and jewelry robbery investigations in my career. So I'm either very good at what I do, or I'm very bad at what I do. <laughs> it's amazing how many times I would pull up to that pawn shop and say, "Well, I would rob this store." You know, mm -hmm. it's it, it it doesn't communicate that the lights are broken, the uh, the the front of the store doesn't present itself well. So I think that's kind of where I would start, and then I would work myself in from there. I mean. You know, uh, uh, what does the showroom look like? What is the back room? And you could do your own inspections uh, uh, with that. But again, like I said, we, we come out, we do a lot of uh, risk assessments nationwide. And it's amazing, you know, we'll find bathroom windows that are unlocked, that you can unlock and just put stuff out in the, or, or trash, you know, a yeah. big exposure is trash. It's amazing how mm -hmm. many dumpster divers there are at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's super awesome advice. And if somebody's looking for, maybe an in-store risk assessment for you, how would they go about getting in touch and what would so, that process look like for them? So our website is sapphirerisk.com. Uh, my name is Tony Gallo. I can be reached at tgallo at sapphirerisk.com. And I can put you in contact with our security team that uh, travels nationwide. Uh, again, if it's not a risk assessment, but you just have some security questions, you know, being in the pawn industry since 1996, we're more than willing to help answer a question if you might have one. That's awesome. Any final parting words, pieces of advice? I think I think the you know it's my favorite industry, the pawn industry. You know, and and nothing take not taking anything away from jewelry or cannabis or firearms, anyone like that. Um, I, I love the ability that uh, that a pawnbroker gives to people who have a need for them. And, and I think the, the best advice I can get, uh, give you is try and look at your store from different eyes. You're in your store almost every single day. And it's amazing how many times uh, I'll walk into a location and I'll point to something and they're like, oh, my God, I walk by that every single day every single day so try and take a different look at it approach you know or maybe have a a family member that doesn't come to the pawn shop just take a walk and say hey do you see anything unusual and they might point something out that's super awesome advice well thank you so much for coming on it was so nice to see you it's been it's, way too long it has been thank you very much all right bye bye